they don't have to be. Any OEM who's doing hardware at the OEM level can control, can, can um, get control and maintain control. Also, you need to know what a shim is. It's the current solution to signing the bootloader's loader. Now, Matthew Garrett's the one who's most, most prolifically talking about this. So read up on him um, if you uh, are going to, if by the end of this talk you care about uh, secure boot. Now, where is it? It's actually hardwired into the motherboard in the EEPROM chip. It's a little erasable programmable read-only memory. It's a little chip that you cannot remove unless you're at OEM level and you're telling the, hard, the um, factories how to manufacture it, unfortunately. Why did we switch from the BIOS to UEFI? First of all, the BIOS was a poorly specified old pile of code, reason number one. It needed updates. It was giving everyone headaches, developers headaches, having to work with it. It was old. It was 20 to 30 years old. It was designed for computers that are funny, and for some of us bring up sentimental, have sentimental value. It was designed for computers that are now in the Computer History Museum <laughs> near Palo Alto, California. If you see that little TRS-80 in the bottom and that brings back nostalgia, that's when the original BIOS was written. Um, the number one reason everybody uses it was written because of security reasons. The security is an entirely different field now. Uh, it's far more sophisticated. And also why? No further support. Um, there's three main companies that have supported this little chip on our motherboard. There's Phoenix Technologies, which only did the old BIOS. There's American Megatrans, which did the old BIOS and is continuing with UEFI, and Inside, um, which is the same. But we all know the main reason why <laughs> we're switching is because none of us want to stick with the old hardware. We all want bigger, better, faster, stronger, and there's no going back. So. Why don't many of us fully understand um, what UEFI Secure Boot is doing and, and how, to, how to get a laptop free of, um, free of uh, signing off the Microsoft key at the end? It's because Secure Boot relies on various systems in the, in the system that um, Usually, usually developers are specifically interested in one segment of this. The only people who have to cross over all these different, I'm not going to read this to you, but the only people who have to cross over into all of these different areas are people like us who build hardware. And generally, people who build hardware, they have to sell it. In order to sell it, you have to become a company. When you become a company, I'll get to that in a minute, <laughs> your focus changes. So there really isn't anyone protecting free and open source software on this level. Okay, the simple explanation for secure boot is an encryption key that checks to see if drivers are certified with a matching key so that it only certifies or executes certified code. The general saying in the community is that the goal is admirable, but the implementation sucks. It leaves a lot to be desired. The not so simple solution is that you can use a tool to generate your own key, your own private key, and then you can sign an OS shim with a pri your private key and put the public key in the BIOS slash UEFI. People will continue referring to it as the BIOS, technically as UEFI. That is a lot, that is a very simple way of saying something that's actually very complicated that only the most technical people um, who are in this room will be able to do. Okay, the when of it. Historically, this started in 2000. Between 2000 and 2004, people started writing code to replace, not us, um, the companies, um, Inside and American Megatrends, started writing code to replace the BIOS. Everyone knew that you can't have a 20 to 30 year old piece of code survive into the future. It was not immortal. It, was, it needed to be replaced a long time ago. So they started creating it. In 2005, um, the industry started transitioning to it. You started seeing UEFI. Um, ironically, the desktops were the first ones to adopt UEFI on their motherboards. We started seeing UEFI um, on some of the motherboards of the hardware we were building. And 2011 was mass industry adoption. Um, it became a design requirement to the point that in... This is the now of it, the state of the union for UEFI. In 2011-2012, systems were shipping with UEFI. Nobody really noticed. 
um, in August 2012 was kind of the, not really the deadline or the, the Windows 8 was launched and the launch has been a lot softer than anybody thought it would be and that's, that's partly, it helps it go under the radar even more. But OEMs did start shipping with Secure Boot enabled on all Windows 8 machines. Um, so desktops and motherboards, most of, desktop motherboards, most of them have UEFI, laptops, some of them do, many of them do. Servers the same, but they're already in a lockdown environment, so it doesn't really matter. Tablets have a different ar architecture, thankfully, and ARM doesn't have a BIOS, so there's no UEFI for it. Although, let it be noted, the Microsoft tablet, um, uh, you cannot boot Linux on a Windows 8 RT tablet. Um, it's not possible. And I know there's some of you that are <laughs> thinking, oh, let me try it anyway, but you'll brick it. So, um, phones use ARM, so phones use ARM, so uh, thankfully we don't have to mess with that. Some laptops, thankfully, uh, the Chromebook uses Core Boot, which might be a potential solution for the community. Um, <laughs> We're already running into trouble. I'm sure y'all have, probably everyone came across the article recently about Samsung. These are the lap, these are the models of the Samsung laptop that people have been trying to load Linux onto and uh, lately it, it bricks it, which we'll see more of. Um, generally, I found that a lot of people aren't actually aware that um, if they go to the store and try to buy a Windows 8 machine, they can no longer wipe it, wipe it and load Linux like they used to. Here's the future. This is just a general prediction, I'm not saying it's guaranteed, um, but this is the this is the direction that we see it heading. The part I wanted to talk to you about is the last one. Now, one of the reasons one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the start key on the keyboard is because back in '98, I think it was. 98, 91, somewhere in the 90s. Microsoft did something brilliant. Their marketing people um, did something that, from a marketing perspective, is brilliant. I say that sarcastically within this audience. From a marketing perspective, it was, anyway. From the, they put their logo on the start key. You start with Windows. It's also called the home key. You go home to Windows. It became, it was so effective that people referred to the PC, the computer, as a Windows machine. Now PC is indistinguishable from a Windows machine. <sighs> Calling secure boot secure, which it is about security, is the second time they're doing that. They are making their OS the secure OS. The irony of it blows your mind. <laughs> but it, it, with the current trajectory, by 2012, Windows will be the secure OS, uh, unless we can make some changes. Okay, now, this is my passion, is how computers are built at OEM level. I'm not going to go into huge detail, because it's fascinating for me, but it's probably boring for you. So generally, at OEM level, there are several ways you can do it. For desktops, there are very few hardware builders that build their own cases anymore. It's generally, you get a case, you get the components, you make sure they all work with the distro you're working with, and you test it and test it and test it, and there you have a great desktop. With laptops, you can no longer go get a white box laptop and buy your own components. You might be able to in some parts of the world, but over the last five years, that's been phased out. You used to be able to do that. You can't any, any longer. Um, so what we do is that at the OEM level, we get them in large quantities so that we can have control over how it's built and what's put on it. Okay, so another part of the how, that's how it's built. How to disable it. This is a really basic, may or may not be fully accurate depending on your experience when you do it. If you want to disable Secure Boot on a computer when you get your next laptop, in a couple years and you can no longer find an old laptop or a, non, a, a, a laptop without an OS on it. You go into the BIOS setup, or the UEFI setup, and it's different for every system. Sometimes it's F10, escape, or delete. So you guys could have probably guessed all that. 
Now for right now, it's just that one key. Every computer will be different. Every model will be different. Um, and that, the way that you get into the BIOS or UEFI is going to change. If you look at how corporations work, that will become, this is just the first step on making it proprietary, <laughs> thank you. It will become a little more complicated. Frogs in a pot of boiling water, you've heard that analogy. It will become a little more complicated each year. Fragmenting the population so that we devote our mental energies to just treading water rather than fixing the problem. You find Secure Boot and disable it. You may brick your machine, we don't know yet. If the system has fast boot enabled, uh, it disables the keyboard. Woohoo! So for fast boot, um, this is by um, Matthew Garrett. He said that the way to do this is basically you start and restart. And I won't read that for you. There are ways around it for now, and we'll continue to find ways around it. One of the many solutions. Okay, but to the next one. How would you enable it? Some people actually may want to enable it. There are, and you'll see reasons why. Um, but just know that for now, if you turn Secure Boot on in any way, it does break Hibernate. And Hibernate's been the Achilles heel of free and open source software for so long, so that's kind of sad. So, doing this, um, it, what I would love to see are some better, stronger solutions to Secure Boot so that as a community and as a force for free and open source software, and I hate saying just free and open, know that when I say that I mean Lieb also, um, that I, I would love to see a more solid solution, and that's why I'm going to be asking you questions in the middle, so that we're not wasting our energy on each different model of computer. One of my pet peeves is seeing, because we're puzzle fixers, because many of us like the puzzle of getting our favorite OS to run on whatever type of machine, and because y'all have a very high frustration tolerance level, we tend to spend a lot of our energy getting one OS working on one computer and then maybe sh one, one model and then maybe sharing that information and maybe so many other people will do that. But unfortunately, that has diluted our energy to the point where there is, it, it's made us vulnerable to corporations, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, so here's the who part. This is the biggest part of the talk. I'm gonna be talking about the, how the distros have reacted to Secure Boot, how the OEMs are handling it, um, the people who put the UEFI code out there, what they're doing. I'm gonna talk about the hardware builders at all different levels and sizes. I'm gonna talk about the leaders and you guys, developers and users, you and your friends. I'm gonna start with the last one first, users, because as I said, uh, as I quoted Eben in the beginning, um, our user base uh, is crucial to our future. A while back I wrote a blog post, sort of tongue in cheek, called Tourniquet, and I wrote it right, uh, right before, I think in July, right before August 2012, right when we were feeling the intensity of, you know, we'd seen Secure Boot coming, we knew it was coming, uh, Windows 8 was launching in full force all of their great advertising, and let's just say it was extremely depressing. So I wrote, an, I wrote a blog post called Tourniquet that got a pretty good response. I recommend that you read it and let me know what you think. Users, these are our future users. Now I mentioned how Secure Boot, how that's brilliantly named how this little bit of proprietary code is being labeled. There are other ways to do security. You don't have to be proprietary about it. But if, okay, this user probably will not disable Secure Boot because disabling security is bad. Only bad people, and, and I have hacker sons, I, I, I get the hacker, I love the hacker vibe, but in general, people have a desire for security. It's a primal need, it's a constant within human nature. 
disabling security is bad, and there's, that's a very generalized statement. But these people will probably not actively disable a secure feature. So our future users, the little six-year-old software guy who's trying to figure out what this kernel thing is, and who was it, the, the guy who started contributing to the video card to Lima when he was 10, <laughs> and he's still contributing. These are the future people that we're all gonna be working with. The five-year-old hardware chick who likes opening up her laptop. Um, things change, perception changes when your uh, when security becomes a feature instead of it just being some fun puzzle to solve. Those kids become the heavy hitters of tomorrow. Um, they're the ones uh, who, who are going to make decisions that will support or not support our distros. They're gonna be sitting there saying, hey, wait a minute, do I really wanna disable secure boot? Disabling something that's secure makes you bad. Thieves disable security. That's, don't take me too seriously there. On a primal level, people crave security. This is a constant. And you've gotta wonder, would these people have contributed if it was more than just a puzzle? Previously, pre-Windows 8, pre-August 2012, all the work that we've done has just been a puzzle. There haven't, there have been legal issues, but nothing like Secure Boot. Okay, so a graphic picture is incoming. Brace yourselves. <laughs> um, I'm gonna just read a little quote from a <laughs> tourniquet. Um, when UEFI's secure boot is implemented at OEM level, all new PCs purchased with Windows 8, it was going to, the, the launch has been much softer than what we all thought it would be because they were getting bad publicity. With the intent of loading your favorite distro, we'll have secure boot. Since the beginning of GNU Linux in the 1980s to 1990s up till now, we've all had the luxury of wiping and loading whatever distro we liked. This gave you the, the ability to flip the bird. I don't know how you say it in other languages. Does that, univer does that translate universally? Flip the bird. That's the yes, thank you. That was the phrase I was looking for. Give them the finger to the proprietary corporations. Um, this is what Secure Boot does as it is currently being implemented. I'm sorry, I love that picture. <laughs> but that's what it does. So, the who, the next part, that's our developer base. We're basically cutting ourselves off unless we find better solutions. Now, this is the most negative aspect of it. This is one way to see it. We are having our ability to wipe and load our favorite distro sliced. And that was, I don't know about you, all of you, I'm sure your laptops and your hardware are very personal. They are, your laptop, if you're, I assume, is like your child. It's very personal to you. Uh, you've probably taken it apart. You've probably had fun with it in many different ways. Well, here's the upside. While it seems like this horrible thing has happened, while it seems like Secure Boot may have hurt us, in the end, if we handle it right as a community and as many different nations at large, it could be what we've been needing all along. And I'm very curious about your opinions. Um, because it is the ultimate differentiating factor. It makes free, deep, open source software unique and not just the second, the, the thing that you put on a Windows machine. It gives it an edge that it never had before. Okay, so who? Quick, quick review of the different distros. Shuttleworth. Now, Ubuntu, um, why did they sign so quickly with Microsoft? Think about it. Shuttleworth, I, no, I, I support these guys, I respect their decision, but think about it. Shuttleworth made his fortune on a key, thought. It was the um, security code upon which all internet banking is based. He, uh, that, that's his area of expertise, that's his comfort zone, so they signed. Fedora. I feel so, my heart broke when I read about them, about them making their decisions. They were stuck between a rock and a hard place. They had to decide whether to become, most distros have this decision. At their point, they were deciding whether to become obsolete and make it impossible for new, less geeky users to load their distro or sign with Microsoft. They took a path that hopefully will pan out all right, but 
Now, I love Open Suse's, um choice. Are there any Open Suse guys here? Oh, okay. It's mostly be, they're over at a different talk. I almost got them here, but they're over at the GNOME talk. Their answer to it is, <laughs> and it is, because the, the Microsoft key that everybody's chaining back to is only part of the verification process. It's deeper than that, and they're creating a second. They, are, they have signed with Microsoft, but they're creating a second level of complexity that um, makes it more secure. Mint, from my point of view, actually gets it. They understand that hardware and software have to be married. They, they understand that the two have to go hand in hand to have stability and um, that freedom will reside in being able to protect it at, within your actual uh, concrete hardware. So they launched their own box. Um, Crunchbang. Um, they're still working on how they're going to respond to it, but the people who are running it are brilliant, and I know they'll find a way. Debian. Okay, does anybody know what Debian's doing? Please. Right here. Um, can we do the mic real quick? I would love to hear your answers. Yeah, this guy right here in the red. Thank you. Debian will not provide a signed bootloader. You have to use any, anything else you can get or you have to disable it. Okay. Otherwise, so anything else will not go, get consensus within the project and we are not a legal entity so we cannot right. obtain a signing key if we w even wanted it. We had to do it through SPI okay. and I don't think SPI will go along with that. Okay. Please, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the energy that's going to push forward towards more solutions that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, the next thing I want to ask you is, what do you know about the other distros? There are many more distros than what I listed. Does anybody have any other feedback on any of the other distros? To be honest, I'm busy building hardware, <laughs> and we're, we're say, we have... We're set up in North America right now, and I just finished setting up in Australasia. We're trying to set up in the UK. Cory Doctorow, y'all know who he is? <laughs> Cory Doctorow essentially wrote a love letter about us on Boing Boing, and so while well, it was really sweet of him, uh, we've been getting a lot of, why aren't you in the UK? Why aren't you in the EU? Which, we're working on it. We're going as fast as we can. So my job is working on that, so I haven't had a chance to follow what the different distros are doing as much as I would love to. Do any of you know what any of the other distros are doing? Puppy Linux, any of them? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So there was a, a discussion on Gen2 Dev about this. I think the outcome was no real decision. Yep. Uh, so a, a bit of also wait and see. Yep. And, and that there, there will be... Uh, anyway, some some solutions, and, and yeah. also the thought occurred that Gentoo users might be able to deal with um, exactly. the situation either exactly. way. Exactly. Since you have to start at source for Gentoo in the first place, they're going to be pushing forward. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So generally, this is kind of what I expected. I was hoping that there'd be like, oh, I know, I know, I know. But generally. There's a, do, do you, you, you get it? There's a general lack of, I have no clue how we're going to handle this. As of right now, as a builder, we're shipping with Secure Boot disabled. And I'm going to talk about some solutions in a moment. If we don't talk about, okay, so from, from the point of view of distros, everything, when Secure Boot was implemented and when we started wrapping our minds around it and over the next year, people will continue wrapping their minds around it. It feels a bit like what we've built, what we've built has, can, if you're not in control of the hardware, what you've built can fall apart. The hardware is the earth under your house. <laughs> it can uh, be taken away, and Secure Boot is doing that. And the reason we're talking about it is to avoid that regret and frustration later. Okay, so Stephen J. Von Nichols is the number one media guy who is wrapping his mind around UEFI Secure Boot. 
And I talked to him and he said at the end of the day, UEFI Secure Boot is far more about locking users into Windows than it is about security. It is the act of a desperate company knowing that it's losing its once iron grasp on the desktop, frantically trying to hold on to its once insurmountable lead. As tablets and smartphones and even PC sales have shown, Microsoft's losing its grip. Excuse me. And one other opinion from our beloved Cory Doctorow. Um, he, uh, the way he talked about it is that a new PC feature called UEFI is making it increasingly hard to install non-commercial OSs on your own computer. Free OSs like Fedora and Ubuntu, sorry guys, are having to pay blood money to Microsoft so their users can install and boot their OSs without having to lift the lid off their machines and change the inner workings. This is a trend that I see getting much worse before it gets better. Now pay attention to that, before it gets better. That's what we're going to be talking about in a minute. Although the right to freely choose and modify your kernel is highly esoteric and technical, that's why we love it, it is the wellspring from which all other technical freedoms arise. I'm sure you can all relate to that. Okay, so now the who of the hardware builders. There are three different types. There are small shops that rebrand. If you go to a corner shop that builds, um, the, and you tell them to build your computer that runs whatever, um, They'll probably put together the components and test it and, and make sure it works for you. We're in the middle category. There's reasons in the middle category. The medium shops that do their own builds, they go to OEM level that are still small. We're so really small. But they go to, uh, but actually do their own runs of hardware at OEM level who work with manufacturers um, in China and elsewhere. And then there's the mega corporations like Google, Dell and Google. I hate putting those two side by side, but those are the main two juxtaposed. Okay, this is us. We're hardware builders in Berkeley, California. We're setting up little shops like this globally. Like I said, we did North America and South America. Those are some of our people. Um, the reason why we're setting up as small shops rather than mega corporations. Now, none of you have probably ever had to call tech support, but think of the friends that you help out who do have to call tech support. <laughs> you don't want to have to help them. You want them to be able to talk to this guy. You want, them to, you want them to be able to talk directly to the guy who built your machine or the guy who actually has an answer, who's actually very familiar with the machine. So what we're doing is we set up the company very differently with very low overhead to make sure that the person who bought it talks to the person who made it. It makes sense. So, um, thank you. <laughs> talk for that guy. <laughs> oh, the guys are going to love that. Thank you. So hardware builders, now there are, now we're a corporation, so there is some, um, it, U.S. corporations are evil, I'm sorry, there's no way around it. Um, so if you hear conflict in my voice, that's why. Um, it's very hard to be a good corporation in the U.S. That's why, that's why we're not building a base in the U.S. Technically our base is in New Zealand, so it's governed by different laws. Um, but having a separate, distinct base in each country allows each country to choose how those computers are governed within the country so that you actually have a voice because you're there and you help have a voice in the government. Anyway, that's the goal. So the hardware builders. Um, you've seen the efforts towards making free and open. Google is, of course, making the biggest headway with its Chromebook uh, and Coreboot, which is a potential new solution. Now, raise your hand if you have seen the corporation. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Less than like 5%, you guys. Okay, I beg you, I beg you to go home and see the documentary called The Corporation. What they did, okay, so in the US, a corporation is treated as an individual. It's given the rights of a human being. So a corporation is a human being. If the company was right here, it would have the rights of an actual human. It pays taxes like a human does. It has all the rights. So what they did, what the, document, what the movie makers did, is they said, well, if it actually was a human being, and we sat it down in front of a psychotherapist, what would the psychotherapist say? Would they say it's a healthy human being? Would they say it's a kind person? They went through, the, it's called the DSM. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Corporations are psychotic killers. I'm not, I mean, literally, literally, because by law, they are killing their peers. Their goal is to dominate, compete. By law, they have to, um, 
the, the, the scariest part is that there is no limit to their earnings. They, they um, have to earn profit. If they do not, their shareholders can sue them. They, it, it, the structure, the laws that govern corporations are such that the corporations have to be evil. Now, I don't believe that everybody that works at Microsoft is bad. I'm sure there's still some good people who work there. When they first started out, they were really cool. Seriously, I grew up near Microsoft. When they first started out, they were hiring really cool programmers. They were people that we liked to hang around with. And then they started hiring more lawyers than programmers. And we said, wow, we don't really like these people as much anymore. They're not that cool. So that was kind of our wake-up call, that something was awry. Um, I, I beg you to watch the corporation because it will give you some insight into how UEFI Secure Boot is going to progress and how your accessibility to free and open hardware is going to change. Okay, so I'm going to make a quick analogy. Have any of you heard of Monsanto? Yes, okay, so this analogy will ring true. <laughs> Thank you. There are two things that I care about, my electronics and my food. I care that they're both pure. Okay, those buildings look relatively similar, huh? We got here, my husband and I got here a day early and we drove up to the Netherlands and lo and behold, I took a picture of that building. There's a Monsanto building just right near here. And that other building is in Redmond. Now here's the part that will also hopefully blow your mind. This is my second blow your mind point. Microsoft is a software company that controls the hardware industry. For one industry to control another but not even have a successful product in it is insane. It's a software company that has managed to position themselves in a way that it controls the hardware industry, but has none of the risk. There is risk in hardware. You get bad, bad runs of things. You get bad, I don't know, memory sticks. You get bad whatever. There is risk in supplying hardware. Monsanto did the same thing. They control the food chain, both with the herbicides, or both with the pesticides, and with the seeds but they have none of the risk. If there's a drought, it's the farmers who are screwed. The parallel couldn't be better. So let's see how we, Monsanto is further progressed than we, than Secure Boot is. Um, so Monsanto provides the seeds. In many countries, I'm sure many of you've read about their sales pitch, they're pitched as magic beans. You're not allowed to, anyway, they, you've heard about the suicides. Um, Y'all have hopefully followed Monsanto from farmers who have unfortunately invested in these seeds and then had years of drought because they were the ones who took the risk. So I love this one. Genetically modified canola has spread into the wild. What will Monsanto do about it? Because the farmers are getting sued. And of course, Monsanto wants to sue nature. That's essentially what it is. If Monsanto, I don't know about here, but if Monsanto's seeds <clears throat> go into the, uh, into the uh, farmland of a neighboring farmer, they can be shut down and sued. Ironically, they both start with an M. So, um, the analogy, as far as I know, there aren't any countries yet that Monsanto has not dominated. I was set up in a company in New Zealand thinking, oh, New Zealand's so pure, they don't use herbicides, they don't use pesticides, they don't use... Um, steroids for their beef and it is very pure and very wonderful but Monsanto is already in phase two there so maybe some of the islands haven't been hit yet I don't know so the the penetration of Monsanto into the market has twisted our mindset to the point where we no longer actually identify food as food this is food <laughs> This actually isn't. It's genetically modified. If you read the list of chemicals, I'm, I'm allergic to wheat. And so a while ago, my husband wrote me a little phone app called Gluten-Free Guide so that I don't get poisoned by the stuff because it's in nearly every wheat in so many things. The list of chemicals and the amount of twisting you have to do to the original food source in order to get that is insane. I'm sure it tastes good. I wouldn't know. But um, it twists our perception. This is the TRS-80. This is the pure computer that you can open up and you can mess with and you can have fun with. And that's where we're headed, anyway. So the, another part of the WHO chain. Now I didn't flesh this out entirely because I want more time at the end. But um, 
retailers are at the very end of this food chain. Um, and they say generally that, you know, food is what it is and the electronics are what they are because of what people request, because of what people ask for. Um, but I don't know about you, but I would rather not trust the general public to keep my hardware free and open and my software free and open. The other, that's just one part of it I'm going to touch on. Another part of it I'm going to touch on, since you probably haven't gone and had your own hardware built at a factory, I'll tell you firsthand that factories are beholden to no one. This is an email that we got from one of our factories. We were trying to get some hardware that we didn't, this was in the early days, we were trying to get some hardware that we didn't have to, that didn't come with the Windows license, that we didn't have to wipe Windows off of. And this is what they told us, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. They're beholden to no one. The only, so if we can have, and I don't care if it's Reason or anybody else, if we can keep people who actually care about free and open source, open source software on the front lines at the manufacturing level, then um, we can find ways around Secure Boot. Now, this is my home. <laughs> this is a picture of the very first Maker Fair. Have any of you been to O'Reilly's Maker Fair? Oh, yes. First year? Second year? Yeah, second. Okay. Third year, Disney was there, and it wasn't as fun. But, um, yeah, the first, first couple years were great. Okay. You used to, how many of you have ever built your own desktop? Please. Yes. Okay. So you know what goes into it. Building your own desktop, you can still do. Building your own laptop, not so much. Building your own tablet, not really. Okay, so you can do it. I mean, Kickstarter, you could possibly have done something on Kickstarter. Kickstarter stopped doing uh, runs of um, goods. And if you want to get 900, if you want to get a whole lot of friends who want the exact same specs you do, you could possibly get, I'm talking about solutions here, you know, what you can do to work around Secure Boot. Um, but the maker, the maker field is too far away from where it needs to be to solve this OEM level problem. Okay, newsflash. Hardware and software need to unite. Floss can't ignore the problem anymore, unfortunately. And educating the public is not the solution. If every single one of us here was able to cite off the top of our heads five ways to get around the UEFI secure boot problem on a computer that your, uh, I don't know, your kid or your parents or something bought at Best Buy or whatever store next week, then, um, then I would say that possibly educating the public is a problem. But if as a community we're having a hard time wrapping our mind around it, that's not the way to go. Okay, so summary, quick, simple summary. UEFI is, is good, Secure Boot's poorly implemented. It's complicated to the point of being dangerous. Some of the world's worst problems were born out of complex situations that were just a little too complex to communicate to the public. I taught French at my alma mater and the, the um, dean of the French school said, it, for every grammar rule, you have to be able to explain it in one sentence with the most simple words. And if you can't, you don't understand it. The same rule applies. We have to be able to get to the point where we can understand that. If not, we have to use some crutches. We have to use some other solutions um, to get around this. It's doable if we cooperate. Okay, so here's the part where I get to meow some of my solutions. Okay, and then you get a turn. We can implement better. Now, all three of these started out with fairly poor initial implementation, and they smoothed out. That's just something we're used to. As initial bumps in the road, and then we get used to it, it goes all right. Okay, so for core boot. Now, core boot was gonna hopefully be the ultimate solution, and it still may be. Google is a large corporation, so we're not 100% sure about that. Pre-Chromebook, pre we didn't have the support of hardware manufacturers. The guys who are working on core boot, the hardware manufacturers talking with Intel and AMD and um, NVIDIA and all of those is not something, you can't get a direct answer to what you need unless you're a Google. Sorry. 
you can also do your own distro is one of the potential solutions because sooner or later there won't be any more windows 7 machines pre windows 8 machines to buy <laughs> so sooner or later we have to deal with this and like you said about gen 2 they can possibly they can be um, one of our leaders and since the users always start at the source anyway and james bottomley is an important one to follow also <coughs> excuse me one solution we just thought of this on our way here literally i don't know why we didn't well, we've been busy with other things. Distros can make their own keys. It's actually not that hard for a distro to make its own key. And the OEMs, such as us, can use that key. So if you know of any distros that want to get around it, let us know. Um, we're not, we are a corporation, but we um, have no investors. We have no shareholders. We've tried to eliminate everything that makes a corp, all of the legal things that make a corporation evil. And the stuff we do every day, we don't deal with keys. We don't deal with all the proprietary stuff and the licenses and other things like that. So it makes life so much nicer. Okay, so really quickly, do any of you have any other solutions? Gen2 guy. Okay, if even a third of the people in this room supported Coreboot, that would be more than sufficient as far as developer power. Go. Uh, you can start. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, did you check your email the last two days? Hmm? Did you check your email the last two days? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> just because I checked it didn't, don't, doesn't mean I saw it. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so I sent you email about, oh. about Coreboot. And yes. yes. Okay, I'll search for it. You saw it? Kathy at Zurizen.com. Yeah. It doesn't matter how you spell the Kathy, just Kathy at Zurizen.com. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay, thank you. So you didn't see it. <laughs> thank you, thank um, you, thank you. I, I would love to talk to you uh, maybe offline, maybe, maybe yes. now. Uh, about Coreboot. Well, I've been involved in the Coreboot project for something like 11 uh -huh. years, and I've, I was at Freedom Hack in Taipei and talked to a oh, bunch cool. of ODMs about this. Um, mm -hmm. That was in 2008 or 2009. Uh, 2008, and at the moment we didn't have, as you say, any support from hardware vendors, as yeah. in AMD and Intel. Cool. Uh, we did have some support from VIA, but not enough. That has changed. Mm -hmm. A bit, so AMD are very much supporting Coreboot. Right. Good. Uh, uh, awesome. Yes, very good. We have, uh, they have contributed a GISA code. I don't know if that means anything to okay. you, but, but yeah. The, that means um, ahead. Their reference code that goes to the IBVs, to okay. Inside and Phoenix and, and AMI, the BIOS okay. companies, to Coreboot under BSD and GPL, uh, right. dual license. So, and they also uh, promised to continue doing this for all coming chipsets and CPUs. They, they see that they have an advantage uh, there doing that. So that's great. As okay. you mentioned, Google, they have been great at contributing uh, code for Intel. Yeah. However, it's not complete. Mm -hmm. There is so the, and, and this is true for both Intel and AMD. Actually, we are now at a point where the hardware components themselves, not even the main board, but the hardware components contain uh, closed mini computers mm -hmm. that need a firmware that no one has the source code for. Right. Uh, it's similar to CPU microcode, but it, it's it's maybe even uh, it's it's taking it even one step one step further. Right. Um, and this code, even not even uh, not even Google had that yeah. code, even though they have yep. the full right, documentation so, and, and so on. So yes. yeah, a difficult problem. Um, you mentioned uh, 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 yes. Let's talk offline. I, I don't want to take yes. too much time. I want to make two comments. Uh, one about Dell. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Shuttleworth about Coreboot some yeah. some time ago, uh, years ago, and I I, uh, I asked him, okay, what, how do you see this situation? And uh, he said that he went to Dell, mm -hmm. and he asked them about getting Coreboot for fast boot time at right. the time. That was his motivation. Good. The answer he got back was that Dell is actually not a big enough customer at their ODM yes. to yes. to get Coreboot on the reference designs that they. Uh, that they package. Yes and no. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, it, it depends on how your company is structured. And that's why I'm growing the reason as small companies, because when a corporation like Dell, when they grow fat, when they grow large and have a large base, then their definition of large is completely different. But if you grow a company small and international, your definition of large is doable. Yes. 
Yes, I agree. I think it's, you're doing it's the right thing. This is a different framework. Uh, uh, yeah, by the way, thank you so much for coming here and, and talking you. about this. This is hugely important. Thank you. Well, I uh, think it's uh, important. Corey, um, could you please go back to the Corey Dr. Rowe slide? Yeah, sure. Oh, crap. None of you saw that, did you? No. Okay, good. That was the answer to the trivia question. Actually, could you do this while I do the trivia question? Get it going. F5. Okay, gotcha. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay, the trivia question while I get there. I am going to pick the first person who I see who can raise their hand and tell me who one of the very first programmers is. And I'm talking to the ENIAC right here. No. Unfortunately, another one over here. No, unfortunately, no. It's, I love this. This is so cool. Right here. Alan Turing. Um, just a second. Say it again. Alan Turing. Nope. I have my list of six here. Yes? No, no, no. You already guessed that. Nope. On the ENIAC, they had six women. And original. they were called computers because they were women who computed. I don't know. I don't know. She's not, no. Grace Hopper was not one of the first. She came a little bit later. Isn't this wild that we don't, go ahead. Yes, yes. Did you look, did you look it up? It's okay if you looked it up. <laughs> it's okay. Woo! Can you run this up there? So I love this. It is so funny. So the, the, there were these guy engineers with their cool glasses and their little pocket protectors. My dad was an engineer, so I totally get that. And they had the women, you know, plugging in the tubes and actually doing the computing, and they called them computers. And later they changed the computer to be the actual hardware and the women to be the programmers. But it was just a bunch of women who were actually doing it, and they did pair programming. And I got to hear Jean Bartik, who is my favorite. I got to hear her speak at the Computer History Museum. And she's got a better memory than I am. She's 80-something, and she's sparky. And originally, the reason why so few people know the original programmers is because in the article, they showed the women working on the computers, and they thought they were just models. <laughs> so the first articles written about them completely ignored the fact that they were the ones actually doing the computing. And it wasn't until just, I don't know how many years ago, that a news, that a media person dug into it and said, well, actually, they were the ones actually doing this. Anyway, I just thought that's funny. So I like to do that one. OK, which quote? Um, Corey, uh, I'm Corey's going to. Go ahead, take this. It's going to take me a minute to get there. There are 50 slides here. Go ahead. Let's take this quote. Go ahead. There you go. Sorry, Just really uh, quick, interject uh, that real quick. Basically, you said that the key would be in EEPROM chip. I, yeah. But, but basically, EEPROM chips are the ones which are UV erasable. So, uh, do you mean flash chip? Mm -hmm. yes. Do you mean flash chip? Ah, you mean flash chip. Yeah, it's basically, mm -hmm. uh, basically one of the researches that I'm doing is basically modifying uh, the, the stock firmware somehow. Okay. Cool. Uh, basically, yeah. uh, the one of the big problem in core boot is that the memory in it takes really a lot of effort to reverse engineer. Right. I managed to abuse the original. original, original What's your name? Uh, What's my, your name? My, my name is Vladimir Serbinenko, and I'm the, I'm the nickname I'm so of, remember that. of PH Coder. I'm Grub Maintainer. Okay. I, Email and, me, please. And, <laughs> and no problem. Basically, okay. then I managed to, managed to basically okay. put core boot. Mm -hmm. by, by using some parts of original BIOS, which, have, which is uh, interesting, perhaps this direction could also bring, not the complete solution, but part of the answer. And right. it also could be a way to modify the keys on the computer to put your own key, because mm -hmm. te from technical point of view, what the secure boot would mm -hmm. be something which would be completely fine if the end user controls the key. If the mm -hmm. end user can choose his key, there would be no problem. But right, exactly. The problem is a Microsoft key, and uh, this right. is because, uh, because of the key modifications that go, go, could go in this direction. Yeah, and, and, and many of the people in here will be generating their own keys, I'm sure, and, and getting around it that way. You can generate your own key uh, that overwrites the Microsoft key. 
but that doesn't solve the problem of incoming users. And I didn't focus too much on those solutions because I want, I want so badly for our energy to go towards making a solution that will work for our moms and dads and our kids and the, the people that we're always doing tech support for. But email me, please. That is brilliant. Doing it on that level could be a huge solution. I've got to go back to this guy. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, just quickly running out of time. Uh, the right to freely choose and modify your kernel is highly esoteric and technical. It is the wellspring from which all other technological freedoms arise. I take that a step further because the kernel isn't the first thing that runs on That's the machine. True. So we, we really need to take control over the firmware. And I, I would like to... As I said, I've been advocating core boot for a very long time, and I find that I can make my point with many individuals that I meet, but please, please support the reason, because... <laughs> well, the, that's the problem, is that we're not, we're not we in a lot of countries just, yet, so no, it's only North okay, and South but, America and Australasia. So, so if you can, then help the reason any, start up in more companies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, in more countries. This is the way to do it, I think. Um, yeah. Well, we're trying to get set up in the UK. But anyway, I'm going to let people go. Thank you yes. so much for coming and come and ask me questions if you want.